However, when we get to the third and fourth energy level, something different happens. Hey, everybody. Professor Davis here, ChemSurvival.com, YouTube channel, ChemSurvival. And for this week's Table Tuesday, I would like to talk to you about the origin of the term transition element or transition metal. You may have heard this term used in your course casually to refer to elements from the D block of the periodic table, or more specifically, a subset of those elements from the D block of the periodic table. Put a pin in that. We will discuss that more next week. But for now, let's dig into exactly why these elements, although we still sometimes argue over exactly which ones belong to the group, have been called transition elements for over a century. So this goes all the way back to Niels Bohr and the Bohr model of the atom. It seems to Bohr as though the composition of an atom must look something like this, right? That, that the atom must have a positively charged nucleus, but that electrons could orbit only at specific distances. At least that's what Bohr believed because, of course, the wave nature of the electron hadn't been fully worked out yet. Nonetheless, his model worked pretty well, and he was basing this on some observations made by other scientists. It was realized fairly early on that the so-called line emission spectrum of an atom is closely tied to the structure of its electron cloud. As a simple example, take the hydrogen atom, wherein an excited electron that's in a higher energy level can fall down into a lower energy level, and in doing so, emit a very specific energy photon of light. And for certain transitions, these photons correspond to the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so uh, what... Bohr was arguing here was that these line emission spectra are evidence for various orbitals or energy levels at which an electron could reside, and it couldn't reside anywhere else. It's fairly elegant proof of a very highly structured electron cloud. Okay, let's move on now. Uh, Erding Langmuir came on in about 1919 and published a very interesting article in which he argued that not only are there various orbitals in which uh, electrons could reside, but that these electrons had to populate these orbitals as we get create increasingly large elements, increasingly large atoms moving across the periodic table from bottom to top, from lowest energy to highest energy. And he very explicitly states that in postulate four of his 1919 paper. Here he says, there can be no electrons in the outside shell until all inner shells contain their maximum numbers of electrons. Now those maximum numbers are two for the first, uh, eight for the second, 18 for the third, and 32 for the fourth. So essentially, Langmuir was arguing that you have to, as you increase the number of protons and electrons in an element, in an atom, you have to fully populate that first energy level with two electrons before moving on to the second energy level, which can take the next eight electrons. Once that's completely filled, the third energy level will take on 18 electrons. And once that's filled, then the fourth energy level will begin to take on electrons, ultimately, until it's filled at 32. But that created some inconsistencies with the periodicity of element properties, and it wasn't quite jiving with the periodic table, which was rapidly evolving into its modern shape that we see today. And so just a couple of years later, Charles Bury, who is closely tied to the invention of the Bohr model of the atom, uh, wrote a paper sort of responding to Langmuir's ideas in his fourth postulate in, uh, in, uh, specifically. And in this paper, he says the following, the elements from titanium to copper form a transition series in which the stable but incomplete group of eight in the third layer is changed to a saturated group of 18. Fundamentally, what Bury was saying here was that it tracked better with the periodicity of the properties of the elements if we didn't consider it as an absolute rule that energy levels had to fill one, then two completely, then three completely, then four completely. Instead, what Beery proposes is this. Imagine if we march left to right across the periodic table, filling these energy levels as we go. From hydrogen to helium, we'd be filling the first. Through the second period of the table, of course, we'd be filling the second energy level. And that all seems to jive fairly well with, uh, with what uh, was being said by Langmuir. However, when we get to the third and fourth energy level, something different happens. What Bury was proposing was that the third energy level would first take on eight electrons, corresponding to what we now know as the third period of the table, before moving on to filling the fourth energy level. Now, the fourth energy level takes on a few electrons, but then, after that, the atom 
transitions back to filling its third energy level with the additional 10 electrons it needs to reach saturation. So we're back into the third, filling that as we move across the periodic table through that D block section. Only after that third energy level has now become saturated does it move back to filling the fourth and outermost energy level of the atom. So it's this filling of the energy levels in a sequential format and then backtracking into a lower energy orbital to add additional electrons that is the origin of this transition element idea. The idea that an element transitions back to filling an inner energy level for a period of time and then it goes back finally to its outer level as we move out of the D block. Well, that's all for today, everybody. Next week, we'll talk about the modern definition of a transition element and what the modern understanding of atomic structure tells us about exactly which elements are and are not transition elements. It's an interesting conversation. I hope you'll join me for it next week. In the meantime, links to the papers will be in the description below. Thanks for watching. Have a great week, everyone. As always, I'm Professor Davis from chemsurvival.com, the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. See you next time.